So this video is all about population dynamics and growth. Um, so it's the material from chapter 12 of the textbooks. So we're going to talk about the factors that affect population size, uh, some of the ways that we can model population growth, um, and then talk about some of the um, some of the reasons why population modeling is important and useful uh, in science and in society. So in the broadest possible terms, populations change as a function of four factors, so birth rates, death rates, immigration, and emigration. Um, and we tend to um, think of those, uh, those four factors as bind, so birth, immigration, death, and emigration. Um, some of those factors can be density dependent, some of those factors can be density independent. Uh, so for example, birth rates um, might increase um, when population densities are higher, because uh, individuals find it easier to find mates, for example. Um, immigration uh, might be increased at low population densities because individuals are finding uh, new unused habitats where food is highly available. Death rates, for example, might um, increase at high population den densities. Maybe there's a higher incidence of disease um, at high population densities. And emigration, again, might increase at high population densities. Maybe individuals need to leave an area uh, that's densely populated so they can find um, an area with, with more abundant resources. So looking at birth rate, immigration, death rate and emigration, we can calculate changes in population size over time. So if you look at this equation down in the corner, this is nt plus 1, that's the size of the population um, at a given time in the future. And we work that out by looking at the population now, that's nt, plus birth rate, plus immigration, minus death rate, and minus emigration. So what this equation that we've seen um, describes is the absolute change in a population over time. Um, but what can be more useful, certainly if we're trying to compare populations, or trying to um, compare between two populations of different sizes, um, is to think of per capita um, changes in population. So where birth rate up here is the total number of births in a population, per capita birth rate is the number of births divided by the population at the time. Um, and so that can be much more useful um, if we're, as I say, if we're comparing between populations, but also an absolute number in terms of population growth might not be that useful to us um, when, for example, it might mean something very different if we're looking at a population of bacteria versus a population of whales. Um, so a per capita, um, per capita data is often more useful in that respect. These graphs just illustrate uh, a concept that we were talking about earlier, which is density dependent. So um, down on the x-axis here, uh, we have population density, and then on the y-axis, birth and death rates. You can see this graph on the right-hand side, uh, death rates and birth rates are constant uh, across a range of population densities, so they're, they're density independent. This graph on the left, you see that birth rate is density independent, it stays constant across a range of population densities, but death rate changes um, as population density increases. So the death rate increases as population density increases. And where those two lines intersect, you have the equilibrium density where population uh, growth will be stable, so zero. So the main factors uh, that influence population changes, birth rates, death rates, immigration and emigration, are themselves affected by a host of different factors. Uh, that can broadly be categorized as biotic and abiotic factors. So biotic factors are factors um, associated with organisms, um, and abiotic factors are factors associated with the physical environment. So biotic factors um, include things like competition, disease, uh, predation, the availability of food. Abiotic factors are things like rainfall, temperature, uh, light availability, um, and maybe, maybe big kind of physical weather events like flooding or hurricanes. Um, 
this is not kind of, it doesn't hold true across the board, but generally we think of biotic factors as being density dependent. Um, and of abiotic factors of being density independent. As I say though, um, those categorizations don't always hold, hold true. And we talked in class about, um, think of examples of um, abiotic factors that can affect population growth in a density dependent fashion, um, so going against the mold. Um, and also thinking of biotic factors that influence population growth in a density independent fashion. So an example of the first um, one of those things might be, um, for example, during a cold snap, uh, maybe um, in a, a low density population, all of the individuals in that population might be able to find uh, a suitable shelter in order to survive that cold snap. But in a high density population, many of those individuals might not be able to compete for shelter. They might not be able to find shelter. And so you actually get much higher uh, death rates in response to that cold snap in a high density population. Um, in terms of the second uh, category, biotic factors like diseases um, often affect populations equally across different uh, densities. So for example, things like uh, Dutch elm disease, which is a fungal pathogen uh, spread by beetles, causes complete uh, mortality in those elm trees, regardless of population density. So this is a biotic factor that affects um, population growth in a completely density independent way. So for the next few slides, we're going to uh, look at life tables. So life tables are a really useful way for us to model certain aspects of population change. And the first thing they do is enable us to understand uh, survivorship within a population. Um, so the first way we can construct a life table, and probably the most um, reliable way, um, is a cohort life table. So this is where we take a large number of individuals and follow them throughout their lives. So at what age uh, do different proportions of those, those individuals die? So that might be possible if we're looking at a relatively short-lived organism, like for example a butterfly. We could identify a thousand butterfly eggs and follow them throughout their lives and look at what number of those individuals die as eggs and at different instars of caterpillars and then at the pupil stage, uh, then what proportion die as, as adults. But obviously we're able to do that because this is a relatively short-lived species that's easy to observe. In many cases, um, species are too long-lived or too uh, highly dispersed to use that method. And so in those cases, we can use what's called a static life table. So this is over a short period of time, we will collect um, data on the age of death of a large number of individuals. So for example, you could look at giant sequoias that live hundreds of years and age them using uh, tree rings. Um, to determine at what age do, do most of those individuals within a population die. A third kind of life table uh, that we can produce is an age distribution life table. So that's at a given time, we can purport, record the proportion of individuals in different age classes within a population. So this can be a really useful tool uh, to enable us to understand um, the age class at which uh, most individuals die, so where's the highest risk uh, of mortality among these age classes. But an age distribution uh, life table also makes some assumptions, uh, like for example it assumes that the, the proportion of individuals within those age classes is staying constant, so it assumes that the population uh, is not growing or falling, and it also assumes that we're not gaining or losing individuals uh, to emigration or immigration. So this is a famous example of a static life table. So in the 1940s, a scientist called, called Adolf Murie studied doll sheep in Denali National Park in Alaska. And um, he collected um, 608, I think, skulls of these Denali sheep. And by using the, the rings on their horns, he could age these different skulls. And so he could determine the proportion of individuals that had died in different age classes among those skulls that he collected. 
So this figure on the left is the life table uh, that was constructed using Adolf Murie's data. And you can see the different columns. So the first column is age in years in this case. Different life tables would use different periods of time for this. So maybe if you're studying bacteria, you might use minutes. If you're studying giant sequoias, you might use decades. So it's whatever works best for the organism you're studying. Then this column is the number of survivors at the beginning of each year. So you can see that although uh, Murie only actually collected 608 sheep skulls, he's expressed um, everything in this column as numbers per 1,000 individuals. And that's to um, make it easier to compare the results of this study uh, with populations in different studies. Um, the third column is the number of deaths during each given year. So using that data, we can then produce what's called a survivorship curve. So these would look very different for different populations. Um, and one thing that's notable about this doll sheep survivorship curve is the high survivorship in young individuals. So it seems that there's really low death rate among these young individuals, and then suddenly a very uh, high death rate once those sheep reach a certain age. So we saw in the previous slides how a life table can be used to construct a survivorship curve uh, for a population. And if we expand life tables to incorporate uh, fecundity data or reproduction data, then we can use that, um, the combination of those things to um, estimate several um, features of a population. So we can estimate net reproductive rate, uh, geometric rate of increase, generation time, and per capita rate of increase. So this is what, what we're going to do for this example life table, which I've put together which is for an annual plant or sunflowers uh, in this case. So just to kind of explain the columns of the table, in the first column we have age in months in this case. So depending on what organism you're studying, again, um, the periods of time in this column will be different. Um, in this case, these plants only live around five months. So um, after five months, you can see that survivorship is zero. So the second column is number surviving to a given month. Then we have the proportion surviving to that month. So that's just a simple conversion. Then the third column has average offspring per individual um, during that time interval. Um, so you can actually see that these plants don't produce any seeds. Um, so by offspring, we're, we're talking about seed production. And these plants don't produce any seeds for the first two months of their life. Then you start to see seed production in months three and four, and then it drops off, drops off again to zero in the fifth month when uh, the plants will eventually die. Then the final column is just the multiplication of those two previous columns. Um, and we can use this data to, as I say, to estimate a number of different features of this population. So the first thing we're going to model for this population is net reproductive rate. So net reproductive rate is the average number of offspring produced by an individual over its lifetime or per generation. Um, so these models are, are really useful, but they are limited by certain assumptions, um, as all models are. But in this case, the model assumes that birth and death rates for each age class are constant. Um, it also assumes that the population under study has a stable age distribution. So obviously, if the age distribution is, is varying wildly, then these, um, these estimates that we make of net, net reproductive rate are only going to be relevant very briefly. The second thing we're going to model for this population is geometric rate of increase. So this is just a ratio of the population size at two points in time. So the, during the period of the study, um, what's the ratio of the population at the, at the end versus the beginning of the study? So if lambda is less than one, then the population is declining. And if lambda is more than one, then the population is increasing. So we can go ahead and start calculating those things. Uh, the first one, net reproductive rate, um, you can see from the equation, is just uh, the sum of that final column. So in this case, we're only going to have to sum these two numbers. Uh, and what we come up with is 7.3133. So that's the net reproductive rate for this population.
that the average number of offspring being produced per, per individual uh, during its lifetime or during one generation. So we can go ahead now and start calculating geometric rate of increase. Um, so you can see, to calculate geometric rate of increase, you need to know the population at the end of the study and the population at the beginning of the study. We know the population at the beginning of the study was 1,000 individuals. So to get the population at the end of the study, we multiply that by um, the net reproductive rate, um, which was 7.313. Um, so what we end up with is... Um, a population at the end of the study of 7,313. Um, so we can now complete that formula and calculate the geometric rate of increase as 7.3133. So you can see that the geometric rate of increase in this case is the same as the net reproductive rate. The reason for that is that in this case we're looking at an organism with pulsed reproduction and no overlapping generations. So what that means is that these sunflowers produce seeds, their offspring, but by the time those seeds germinate and produce the next generation, that sunflower has died. And so the reproductive output of one generation is equal to the population of the next generation. So there are many organisms that follow this pattern of pulsed uh, reproduction and no overlapping of generations. And the best example are these, these annual plants, so similar to sunflowers. Um, flowers of one generation will will uh, be pollinated and produce seeds. That's the reproductive output. And by the time those seeds germinate, the parent plants have all died. So there's no overlapping gen of generations. And the reproductive output of one generation becomes the population size of the next generation. A similar thing is true of many insects, like the zebra longwing butterfly. A uh, female might lay 30 to 50 eggs, but by the time those eggs mature, uh, the females that lay them have died. So there's no overlapping of generations, and we get this pulsed reproduction uh, with each generation. So we're now looking at another example of a life table, this time for an organism with continuous reproduction and overlapping generations. So I've chosen garter snakes. So I've come up with a life table where um, individuals live about four years, so um, X in the first column is in years this time. Um, and there's an additional column on the right-hand side, which is um, X, LX, MX. So it's a multiplication of uh, the age class in years and um, LX, MX, which is the previous column. So we can again now use this data to calculate other um, or model other elements of the population. So things like generation time and per capita rate of population increase. So generation time uh, is calculated as the, the sum of that final column divided by net reproductive rate. So generation time is the average age at which a mother gives birth to her offspring or the time it takes um, to go from egg to egg or seed to seed, etc. So to go from one generation to the next. Um, and incidentally, there's a very tight relationship between generation time and body size in organisms. So you can see in this figure, um, in, in the bottom corner, you have a lot of very small bodied organisms like bacteria, and their generation times are extremely fast. All the way up to the top corner, you have the, the largest organisms on Earth, the giant sequoias, um, and indeed their generation time is extremely long. And so that that uh, trend holds pretty true across most organisms. So now we can um, calculate per capita rate of increase. So this is the, the log of net reproductive rate uh, divided by generation time. Per capita rate of increase is, um, is usually um, written as the letter R, and it can be interpreted as the per capita birth rate minus the per capita death rate. So if R is less than zero, then the population is falling. And if R is greater than zero, then the population is increasing. So based on that uh, garter snake life table, let's first calculate generation time. So that's going to be the sum of that final column, X, L, L X, M, X, over net reproductive rate. Um, 
So in class, I'll give you time, obviously, to work these things out. But in this case, you can see generation time of these garter snakes is 2.3007. So remember, we're working in years this time. Um, so 2.3007 years is the generation time of these garter So now let's calculate per capita rate of increase, or R. So that's the log of net reproductive rate over generation time. So in this case, 0 0.0171 divided by 2.3007. So we have an R of 0 0.0074. So that's a positive R. So we're seeing a growth in population in this case. So here are all those formulas for counting, uh, for calculating or, or modeling net reproductive rate, geometric rate of increase, generation time, and per capita rate of increase. And I'll leave them here just for a second so that you can potentially note them down. Um, modeling or estimating uh, these things from life tables is definitely something that's going to come up in exams. So I'm going to switch gears now and start uh, and describe um, some common population growth models. Um, so models that you'll hear about a lot are geometric growth, exponential growth, and logistic growth. So I'll just describe what those models look like. So geometric growth um, occurs when a geometric rate of increase, or lambda, uh, remains constant for a period of multiple generations. So for example, if we look back to our uh, sunflower example, we have a proportional increase uh, in population over the course of one generation. And if that proportional increase uh, remains steady over several generations, then the absolute increase in population is going gonna, is gonna to be greater and greater over time. And it leads to this kind of J-shaped curve. Um, so this kind of population growth can only really occur when resources and space are plentiful um, and when um, birth rate um, immigration, death rate, and emigration, so all those features of BID, are all uh, density independent. Exponential, exponential growth occurs when per capita rate of increase, or R, remains constant for a period of multiple generations. So it occurs in species with continuous uh, reproduction and overlapping generations. And again, it only occurs when uh, space is plentiful, and resources are, are limitless. So you get this ever-increasing rate of population growth, and again, a kind of J-shaped curve. So you might think that uh, geometric growth and exponential growth would not occur um, in, uh, in nature, because, of course, in nature, resources are limiting. But there are situations in which they do occur. It tends to be when um, species are recovering from a crash in population, um, or they're just colonizing a new area. Um, and it occurs, of course, when, when resources for that population are not limiting. So one example is this bird. This is a whooping crane. Um, they make their home um, in a place called Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta. Um, and in the 1940s, because of habitat fragmentation and hunting, their population was reduced to 15 individuals. So since that time, because of conservation efforts and, um, and laws against hunting this species, uh, their population has grown exponentially, which you can see from this graph. Uh, and their population's gone from 15 in about 1940 to now, in uh, most recently in about 2010, I think there are 383 individuals. So this species uh, population or this population is still growing exponentially. Another population that's been growing exponentially is uh, the human population of Earth. So you can see um, the shape of this curve is, is a very distinctive J. Um, frighteningly, if you look at uh, the population change over time, the population was 1 billion in 1804, and it took 123 years to get to 2 billion. Um, compare that to uh, the population of 6 billion in 1999, took only 12 years uh, to become 7 billion in 2011. So the population is doubling every 40 years. Um, so if that's sustained by 2040, uh, there'll be 12 billion people on Earth. 
So the human population has been growing at about 1% per year throughout the, the 20th century. And there's a quite a frightening quote from uh, Cipolla in 1978 uh, that says that if 20th century rates of population growth had prevailed since the invention of agriculture, the earth would now be encased in a squiggling mass of human flesh, thousands of light years in diameter, expanding outward with a radial velocity many times greater than the speed of light. So I think that the big take home from that is that although the human population is, is increasing exponentially, we are pretty soon going to reach uh, some kind of carrying capacity or some kind of level uh, whereby the, that increase in population is going to slow or stop. So that limitation of resources is what's incorporated into our final population, population growth model, which is logistic growth. So in this model, um, over time, the population grows at an, an ever-increasing rate until it reaches an intrinsic uh, rate of increase, uh, which is R max. Um, then, um, as the population reaches some kind of carrying capacity, uh, that rate of population increase slows down and eventually stops at carrying capacity, or K. So that final um, section of the logistic growth model, um, which I've circled, 1 minus NT over K, um, essentially describes environmental resistance to population growth. So if N population size is smaller than K, the carrying capacity, then uh, that part of the equation is greater than 1 and the population grows. If population is greater than the carrying capacity, then that part of the equation is less than 1 and the population declines. And if population is equal to carrying capacity, then environmental resistance to population growth is equal to 1 and the population remains stable. So what determines carrying capacity? Um, well, that can vary depending on what kind of resource is limited. So this is an example from your textbook. This is a Joseph Connell study uh, where he looked at the colonization of uh, an intertidal zone with barnacles. Um, so he tracks the colonization of that zone um, over time. And essentially, as you can see from the picture on the right, Ultimately, ultimately, what limits these barnacles is space. So they run out of area of rock to latch onto. And so in this case, it's uh, space that determines carrying capacity. So this is another example from your textbook. This is uh, African buffalo on the Serengeti. And for a long time, they were um, subject to a, a disease uh, called rinderpest, which uh, limited their population. But when that disease was eliminated, uh, their population began to grow, as you can see from the graph on the left. But eventually it started to level off after about a decade, and that was because uh, limitation uh, of food limitation. So the grasses that they fed on um, became overgrazed and limiting for the population. And so after about a decade, uh, these African buffalo reached their carrying capacity. So in this video, we've talked about modeling populations um, and using models to estimate certain parameters within populations. But in order to do that, in order to come up with these, um, these growth curves, we need to, to know uh, what a population's carrying capacity is or what its intrinsic growth rate is, R max. Um, so how do we know that uh, before going into producing these models? Well, in most cases, we have to determine them by empirically collecting data um, from a population over time. Um, so that involves a lot of field work and a lot of uh, true natural history uh, knowledge of the organism that we're studying. So being able to um, estimate and model changes in population over time uh, can be incredibly important um, in a number of different areas. So there are a huge number of applications. Some of those are important in industry, so understanding what's happening to fish numbers in key fisheries. So this example on the right is Atlantic cod, which suffered a huge uh, decline in numbers in the mid 90s. So being able to model population change means that we can track these species and make sure that we're not overfishing um, and ensure that we're fishing in sustainable ways. So another practical application is to estimate changes in the population of threatened species. So species that we're particularly interested in from a conservation standpoint.
So species like mountain gorillas, polar bears, Canadian lynx, or salamanders, the Schuston very kind of famous and charismatic example. But we're obviously interested in, in tracking the populations of these, uh, these animals so that we can understand um, how effective our conservation efforts are being.